Open up your Bibles to James chapter 5. I could talk about that stuff for all morning, but let's get to what we're doing here. James chapter 5. This is part 6 of a sub-series of a larger series, for those of you that are taking notes. Our series through the book of James has been called Walking the Narrow Path, hence the graphic up there, the narrow path. But we've paused here in chapter 5, verses 13 to 18 um, for kind of another little series, this is part 6 of it, called uh, Just Get Done with the Book of James Already. No, it's called... Uh, <laughs> People are like, aren't you done yet? And I'm like, we're hanging right at the very end. And you know, there's only two more verses left. And those, that should only take me about another eight to 12 weeks. Just, <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. So the, we paused here in verses 13 to 18 for something we're calling the Christian's toolbox. And um, you know, we started off this little sub-series six weeks ago with the idea that there's a right tool for the job. And of course, every man knows that. There's a right tool for the job. And it's, it's you know, any guy will tell you, first of all, if you're any like a MacGyver kind of guy, like Andrew back here is a MacGyver kind of guy, you know, if he doesn't have a hammer, he'll you find something that works like a hammer. If he doesn't have a wrench, you'll find something that works like a wrench. But for most of us, um, you know, you can use a wrench to drive in a nail, I have before, but it doesn't work near as good as a hammer. The hammer is designed for that, for that purpose. And so too, as a Christian, God has given us a lot of great tools for our personal growth and our daily walk with, with Jesus. But those tools, even God-given tools, uh, they work best when we use them as he intends us to use them and as he instructs us in the use of of them. So like any good tool, it's important to know uh, how to use that tool. So James chapter 5 verses 13 to 18, follow along with me. Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing psalms. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three, and, for three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth produced its fruit. So here in this toolbox of things that God's given us for our personal growth and for the edification of those around us. We've, we've been in it. This is our sixth week now, and this is going to finish. And I told you before, this is not an exhaustive list of things that God has given us for our growth and for our encouragement. It's just what's listed in these particular verses. So we've already looked at prayer. We've looked at praise. We've looked at the leaders that God's given us in our churches to help us. We've looked at faith. We've also looked at one another as tools that God gives us for personal growth, not only my growth, but also for your growth. And then the last one that we're going to look at is prayer. Wait, we started with prayer. We already did prayer, right? Well, we're going to do it again. And, and the section begins with prayer, back up there in verse 13, and it ends with prayer all the way down here in verse 18. And if there's anything in our toolbox here that is doubly important, it would be prayer. Now, one of the things, of course, we're assuming is the knowledge of and the study of God's word and sharing our faith with other people. Like I said, it's not an exhaustive list. We're just dealing with the things here in verses 13 to 18, but we're circling back around to prayer. Now, you guys know, I've taught on prayer lots of times in this church, and we, and we pray in this church, and we like to pray. But here, in, uh, particularly in verses 16 and 17, uh, we've got a kind of a different perspective on prayer. Maybe a couple of things we haven't thought of. So let's take it apart like this. Point number one, it's on the jumbotrons, it's on your handouts. Point number one is this reference to effectual prayer. Notice what it says. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. There in verse 16. Effective or effectual, depending on what translation you're reading. Now, in working on this, in studying this, the latter portion here, verse 16, 
every translation or every rendering of this passage seems to struggle just a little bit getting at the meaning of these words. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. What exactly does that mean? Like, for instance, um, I just read out of the New King James Version. Uh, the NIV, the New International Version, uh, says the prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Okay, that's good. The New Living Translation reads, the earnest prayer of a righteous person has great power and produces wonderful results. Okay, that, that's okay too. But the Amplified Version, if you guys ever have the Amplified Version in your uh, toolbox at home, and if you ever make use of the Amplified Version of the Bible, um, it's the same as every other one, it's just louder, because it's amplified. <laughs> and, just kidding, it's not that. Um, but it does, <laughs> it does a little bit better job of expanding on what's contained in the Greek, because you guys know, uh, in Greek there's not always a one-to-one -one translation correlation. You know, one Greek word doesn't translate into one English word. And let me read you the Amplified Version of the latter portion of verse 16. The Amplified Version goes like this. The heartfelt and persistent prayer of a righteous man or believer can accomplish much when put into action and made effective by God. It is dynamic and can have tremendous power. Now that gets it. That gets it. it uh, again, it, again, the, the heartfelt and persistent prayer of a righteous man, a believer, can accomplish much when put into action and made effective by God. It is dynamic and can have tremendous power. Now the word effectual or effective, used here in conjunction with fervent, which we'll get to in a minute, means to be at work or in active operation. Now, some of you guys understand now that on your phones or on your tablets or something, uh, your phone, or your tablet, or your computer at home can run a little bit slower if there's a lot of background apps that are running. You guys ever deal with that, background apps on your device? And so maybe you've, when you first got your phone, you went through and you shut down all the background stuff that runs or on your startup, on your computer at home. So every single program in your entire computer doesn't start up all at the same time. Is anyone with me on this? Okay, a couple of you guys are. Okay. Well, prayer is described here as effectual. That means it's in active operation. Now, I want you to lock on that. It's in active operation. Now, this is our first clue to the kind of prayer that's being described here in verse 16. It's in active operation at all times. It's a background app. It's always running. So it's not something that stops and starts. And we've got you know, I don't even have enough time to go through all the exhortations in Scripture for continuous prayer. You guys know most of them, uh, like 1 Thessalonians 5.17, the first Bible verse I ever memorized. Why? Uh, because it's only three words. That's why. <laughs> Pray without ceasing. You guys know that one? How about Luke chapter 18, verse 1? Jesus taught his disciples a parable that they should pray at all times and not lose hope heart. Romans chapter 12 verse 12, continuing steadfastly in prayer. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 18, praying always. Colossians chapter 4 verse 2, continuing earnestly in prayer. We're going to talk about earnest in a minute. Continuing earnestly in prayer. Now, I think where we make a mistake, or maybe this is just me, I think where we make a mistake is we think that this means we have to continually be stopping what we're doing. Okay, I gotta pray. It says pray without ceasing, so I gotta, okay, put down my work. I have to stop for a minute. Okay, okay, Jesus, you know, I gotta pray, because it says pray without ceasing. Okay, I gotta go back to work. No, it says pray without ceasing. I gotta go back to prayer again. You know, and, and we think that that's what it means to pray without ceasing. And I think that's a mistake bowing our heads and engaging in some kind of formal address to God. Rather, prayer, this kind of prayer, is the lifting up of our hearts and needs to God that should be regular and a working habit of our lives. In other words, it's not prayers, it's prayer. That may be a subtlety, but think about that. It's not prayers. Is that up there on the screen? 
it's not prayers, it's prayer. So then, prayer should be the lifting up of our hearts and needs to God, and that should be a regular or working habit of our lives. So I'm, I'm not asking if you pray. I'm asking, is prayer in active operation in your life? Do you understand that? Is prayer in active operation in your life? Again, we have a tendency to treat prayer in, in a couple of different ways. We treat it as a formality. We treat it as a habit. We treat it as something we have to do because God tells me I have to do it. We do treat it as an inconvenience. Oh, I gotta you know pray for the food and it's hot and if I don't eat these french fries really, really quick, they get soggy, so, you know, but I gotta pray, so I have to pray first. You know, it's, or we sometimes we just consider prayer to be useless. We get, consider, don't tell me you've never thought that because you have, because I have. Why pray? Why? My prayers never seem to get answered. But have you ever seen prayer as a working tool? Have you ever seen it like that? This is a working tool in my life. F.B. Meyer, great Bible commentator, says this little quote, and I love the way this quote starts. He says, fall on your knees and grow there. Think about that. Fall on your knees and grow there. I like that. Half of the women in the church go, oh. And the men are like, what? Do what? On my knees for what? <laughs> Those guys, we're such idiots. Love you women. Fall on your knees and grow there. And he goes on like this. There is no burden of the spirit, but is lighter by kneeling under it. Prayer means not always talking to him, but waiting before him till the dust settles and the stream runs clear. Again with the ladies. Prayer does not always mean talking to him, but waiting before him till the dust settles and the stream runs clear. Sometimes that's what prayer is. It's just my time to get reorganized. Sometimes it's talking to him, sometimes it's listening to him, sometimes it's just pausing momentarily with my attention engaged on him for nothing more then, Lord, I just need to let the dust settle here for a minute. Just, I just need a minute here. <laughs> and God's like, go ahead, I've got all the time in the world. <laughs> Perhaps that is when our prayers are made effective by God. That's where they get made effective by God. And that is the key, that our prayers would be effective, right? That's what we want. But for our prayers to be effective or effectual, they need to be, point number two, fervent. That's also there in verse 16. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Fervent. Now, this word is used in direct connection with the word effective or effectual. They're used right together in the Greek, almost joined together. And I really love this word because it means extended, stretched out, or strained. I like that description of fervent prayer, extended, not time-wise, but stretched out or strained. It can also include the idea of hot or boiling. Now, here's an important thought. Just give this to you, let you work it out. Fervent does not mean emotional but neither does it exclude that. Neither is fervent prayer necessarily long. I've always been impressed by Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verse 2, that says, God is in heaven and you are on earth, therefore let your words be few. Hmm. Maybe I shouldn't say anything else. <laughs> Jesus gives us the same idea in Matthew chapter 6, verse 7, where he talks about the pagans who think that they're going to be heard by God for using many, many words. Now look, this doesn't mean that you can't talk to God all you want. You can. But if you think that uh, more words means it's a more effective prayer, or if you think that louder or more emotional is, is a more effective prayer, or if you think that that's what constitutes fervent, it's not. But it might be this, I think, again, 
I just give you this for your own consideration. Fervency, I think, leans into God. Fervency leans into God. Is that up there on the screen? Yeah, it is. Um, in, in Philippians chapter 3, um, you guys know this passage, the Apostle Paul talked about leaving what is behind. Philippians chapter 3, verses 13 and 14, where he says, Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward. There it is. There's that stretching out, that reaching forward, reaching forward to those things which are ahead. And, and further in verse 14, I press toward the goal of the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. That reaching forward, that pressing forward like, like a runner breaking the tape. You know how a runner breaks the tape in the race. They, uh, they stretch out. My favorite in pro bike racing, you know, the, the best pro bike racers are the guys that have a good throw. And that means when they get, to the, when they get right to the finish line, they just have a way of just m nudging their bike forward an extra couple of inches. And sometimes that last little throw that they push forward on the bars gets them ahead of the guy right next to them or the gal right next to them. It's that leaning forward, and I think that what fervency does in prayer, fervency leans into God, and, and I think it's as, if, it's as if we're seeking to take a tighter and tighter hold of God himself as we plead with him in prayer. Have you ever felt that way? It's like, I just, I just need a more, of, I got to be closer to him, I've just got to be there, I got to get in his grill about this, I just, I need more of him, you know. But as I said, you know, fervent is not necessarily uh, outward or ecstatic or emotional. Uh, again, uh, you know, there, uh, I've I prayed a lot in my Christian life, I know you guys have too, uh, I, I know we've all been in uh, dozens of prayer times and prayer meetings and everybody prays a little bit differently and I don't want to necessarily criticize the way that anybody prayers prays but I do want you to think about the idea that louder and more emotional and more words uh, does not necessarily make fervent and I, I've I prayed with people that seem to think that you know, if I just if I just ratchet up the emotional content in my voice, that makes for a more fervent prayer. But then on the other hand, I prayed with people that I've heard them just absolutely cry out from the bottom of their heart to God. And it was loud and it was messy and it was emotional and it was fervent and it was effective. I, I just don't want us to fall into the trap of having to use something like that as a device. I want people to be impressed with the way that I pray, so I'm just going to pray louder or more emotional. I don't know. I, I just got a weird thing about that. Maybe it's just me. When I look at what to me is the greatest prayer of faith ever prayed, I find it in Matthew chapter 26, uh, verses 36 to 39, and this is Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. And it says that when he called his disciples, um, he took a couple of them, Peter, James, and John, uh, with him, and he began to be sorrowful and deeply distressed. And he said to them, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. Stay here and watch with me. And he went a little bit further, fell on his face, and prayed, saying, Oh, my Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. And, and when I read that prayer, I, I don't necessarily hear him yelling or crying out in a loud voice. Uh, I, maybe he did, I don't know. And it's impossible to enter into Jesus' state of mind at this point. There's no way to know exactly where his head was at. But we can observe his prayer from the outside and, and try to derive something from it. So what I, what I think I see when I look at this prayer as I see only the process of his heart surrendering to what God had willed. And I wonder, too, if we don't miss that about prayer. Sometimes what prayer is, is us going through a process of surrendering to God's will. And prayer is where I go and I struggle with that. Lord, I don't like this. I don't like this one bit, Lord. I don't want to do this. I don't want to go here. 
I've been down this path before. I don't want to go down this path again. And yet, Lord, you seem to be taking me down this path. Why are you doing that? I don't want to do this. Well, I guess maybe I will if that's what you want me to do. Lord, you've done it for me before and I survived. Lord, not only did I survive, you brought me through it and you brought me into a better place and I grew as a result of it. Okay, Lord, if this is the way we're going to go, well, then let's go because I know you're going to go with me. It's just that process of working through the, the emotional content of the things that are going on in our life. And I see prayer very much in that way. I hope that makes sense. But you look at the simplicity of Jesus' prayer there in Matthew 26, but would you say that he did not pray fervently? You can say that, could you, about Jesus? He didn't pray fervently. You know, if he just would have offered up a little more faith, maybe he wouldn't have had to die on the cross. <laughs> you can't hardly say that. Look, have you ever been praying and you've been completely halted in your prayer just because you didn't know what to say? Uh, we got Romans 8.26 to lean on there. The Holy Spirit intercedes for us. If you don't know how to pray, don't worry. The Holy Spirit's going to pray for you. Have you ever tried to pray, but you had no idea what to even say or to ask for? I got no idea where to go. This is where we lean into God. We lean into Him and seek Him and Him alone as the only one who can understand what's going on in my heart and my mind, even though my words may not be able to express it. I can't articulate my emotional or mental state, but God knows it. And when I can't, the Holy Spirit's there saying, okay, I know you can't pray, but I'll pray for you. And Jesus even lives to make intercession, intercession for us. That's prayer on the behalf of somebody else. So even when I can't, I know that he's got it going for me. Yeah, that's a good place for that. This is where we lean into God. I think the writer of Psalm 73 gets this. I think. Psalm 73, verses 25 and 26. You could turn there if you wanted to. Psalm 73, what did I say? 25 and 26. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know this passage. It's a great refrigerator magnet. Most of you got it as a magnet on your fridge at home. Whom have I in heaven but you? And there is none upon earth that I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Boy, that's leaning into God for everything that he can provide and all that he can provide when I am running all the way down on zero. The needle's on E, and I don't know what else to do. But there's another qualifier here back in James chapter 5, verse 16. The effective fervent prayer of a righteous man. And it's not man being the gender man. It's just an editorial man. That means any human being. So who's righteous? Who's righteous? And what does that mean? Well, righteous simply means right standing before God. It means God sets you right. It gives you the ability to stand before him and everything is right. When the Christian dies, the Christian can stand before God and everything's right. Everything's okay. So the righteous one is the one made righteous by Christ. That's who the righteous one is. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, it says that he, God, made him, Jesus, who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. See, the ability to stand before God and have God say, you're right with me. That doesn't come from anything that we do because I can't make myself that right. I can't make myself that good. So it has to come from somewhere else. It comes from him. So when I place my faith and trust in Jesus for who he is and what he did for me, his death on the cross and subsequent resurrection from the grave, when I place my faith and trust in him and I am born again by his Holy Spirit, he's the one that makes me righteous. So if you're a Christian here this morning, if you've been born again by his spirit, he made you right with him. You are one of the righteous ones. You are a righteous one that is made righteous by Christ. And all this means, again, is that the effective and fervent prayers are offered by those who have been born again by God's spirit. They are the ones who are made righteous by faith in Jesus Christ. Look, if you're not a Christian here this morning, and I don't want to assume that everybody is or everybody isn't, but if you're not, then you're attempting to use a tool that you don't own. You can't pray effectively or fervently if you don't know the Lord. You are seeking a gift from someone who is not your father, yet. 
Proverbs chapter 15, verse 29 reminds us, the Lord is far from the wicked, but he hears the prayer of the righteous. God will hear the prayer of anybody that's calling out to him for forgiveness of sins. But there's a special, I don't know, hearing, special frequency that he hears when his kids talk to him. And if you've been born again by God's Spirit, then you're one of his kids. If you've not been, then you need to be adopted into his family. And you can be this morning, and I pray that you would be by the time this service is over. Look at Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7. I'll tell you, this is just how spiritual I am. I just grabbed a chunk of Bible, flipped it over, it went straight to Matthew 7. You know, that's, that's how the pros do it, right there. <laughs> what are the odds? <laughs> Matthew chapter 7, verses 7 to 11. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, that's pretty funny. Um, Matthew chapter 7, verses 7 to 11. Here's what Jesus says about praying to God the Father. If, if God is your Father here this morning, he says, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. He who seeks finds, and to him who knocks it will be opened. Or what man is there among you if his son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will he give him a serpent? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? God delights to do good things for his kids. And I think sometimes we don't have all of those good things just because we don't ask him. Lord, I want everything that you have for me. But you notice also something else there in Matthew chapter 7. Your father. You are the one. You are the one that has to decide this morning whether God is your father. If you've been adopted into his family. If you have, then he is your father. If you have not, then you can be. Because he is ready to take anyone into his family that wants to be a part of his family. And all it takes is the surrender of your will to him. Have you been adopted into his family? If so, then you can not only approach God... You can approach him as your father. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 19 and 22. Every time I say things like that, I always feel the necessity to qualify that just a little bit. Because I know that not everybody in this room perhaps had the greatest dad in the world. Because as far as I know, I'm the only one that had the greatest dad in the world. Because I thought my dad was the greatest dad in the world. And so when, when I got saved, I was 23 years old when I got saved. When I got saved and the, the church, the pastor told me that my heavenly father loved me, I totally understood it. When they said that he's your father and you can pray to him, you can approach him, he loves you, he cares for you, made total sense to me. I did not have any difficulty with that concept. But I know that some people do. So perhaps the point of distinction is your heavenly father may be everything that your earthly father was not or is not. Now it's the righteous person that understands that prayer, and you guys have heard this before, prayer is not getting my will in heaven, but God's will on earth. It's not about getting my way. It's about getting his way. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Do you understand what that means when you say that? I heard somebody say, you can't pray thy kingdom come until you pray my kingdom go. <laughs> it's God's will that we want, not our own. But James adds something else here in verses 17 through 18. And he adds this just for us. And it's a great encouragement. He talks about Elijah. Elijah's a man just like us. And I think we tend to look at some of the Bible characters, and Elijah is certainly one of them. We look at this guy and he's like superhuman. He's like a Marvel comic or something because the guy just does some crazy stuff. And you can read about his life in 1 Kings chapter 17 all the way through 2 Kings chapter 2. Larger than life, uh, more powerful than a speeding locomotive. I mean, the guy just rocked and you look at him and you think, man, what a dude. Uh, you know, I would love to be a guy like that, but you know, that's Elijah. And that, you know, that's just Elijah. 
But, it, it, you know, you look at some of the things they did and you think that's not even possible. But look at, look at what James says here in verse 17. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. What does that mean? He's just a dude. That's all. Just a dude like anybody else in this room. Same kind of nature, just a regular old human being. And yet, he is without question one of the greatest and most powerful prophets of God in the history of the world. And certainly in scripture. And yet, he's just a regular guy. The heroic acts, the miracles, faith like a mountain. And James says he's just like us. See, I think we can underestimate, I think we can underestimate our own abilities, but I don't want us to ever get caught underestimating how God can use you. Because he can, and he can use anybody, and if he can use a donkey to talk to a rebellious prophet, which he can, that verse always gave me great hope for being a pastor. If you can make a donkey talk, well, he can use me too. So, but, but the fact is, is all of these people that we read about in the Bible are just they're regular folks, just like you and me. Don't ever underestimate how God can and will use you. God doesn't need superhumans, only humans that are ready and willing to be used by him, and he uses anybody that is saved. He made you righteous if you've been born again. Now let him use you as you seek to get aligned with his purpose, and as you do, you will see prayers answered in abundance, because it's the, the aligning with his purpose, where we'll see the answered prayers. I think oftentimes, the prayers that we pray, you guys have heard me say this before, the prayers that we pray, we pray them, and we mean it, and we're honest, and we're earnest even in our prayers, but and we don't get our prayers answered. And it's because God just simply said, no, I'm not going to do that for you. I'm doing something else altogether over here. So if I'm not getting my prayers answered, is it, have you ever thought or considered for a moment that maybe you're praying, your prayers are not aligned with his purpose? How about this? Lord, align me with your purpose. How about that prayer? Lord, help me to pray in alignment with your purpose that I might see answered prayers. You think God's not going to answer that prayer? Come on. He will, and in abundance. Fourthly, and my last point. You guys are kind of dropping off on that. I think you're kind of dropping off on it. Keep going. Yeah. Kennedy says keep going. All right. That's it. Get out your sack lunch. Take off your shoes. Right on, buddy. Thank you. See, what we, what we got in the habit of years ago is when I would say this is my last point, everybody was so relieved that it was my last point. They'd say, oh, amen. So that's what that is, if you didn't know. Fourthly is earnestly. Earnestly. Down there in verse 17. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed earnestly. Earnestly. Who's earnest and what's he doing there? Earnestly. This is our last key to effective prayer. Earnestly. Some translations will also render that word earnestly as fervently, just like we read just a few minutes ago. But it's a different Greek word. And this word can mean intensely. And it can also be rendered, and I like this, and it's I'm not even sure if I understand it, but I like it. It can also, this word earnestly can also be translated as, in prayer he prayed. In prayer he prayed. And I kind of like that. And it made me think about a passage in Genesis chapter 32, verses 22 to 32. And it's an odd little story back there in Genesis 32 about Jacob getting in a wrestling match with God. Right? You guys, some of you guys remember the story. You can read about it later. I'm not going to go there. Genesis 32, 22 to 32. He got in a wrestling match with God. And, and what's odd, of course, is that no one can wrestle with God and win. There, you guys remember the play back, I think it was in the 70s. Um, your arms are too short to box with God. Remember that play? Anybody remember? Nobody remembers that play. Okay. <laughs> Another cultural reference down the drain. Darn it. I'm so disappointed. But Jacob wrestles with God, and yet it says that Jacob persevered. And, and Jacob said, you know, he was holding on to this angel that was, that was an incarnation of God, quite possibly Christ in the Old Testament. And Jacob was holding on to him so tight 
He said, I'm not going to let go of you until you bless me. I'm not going to let go of you until you bless me. And God did bless him in spite of the fact that God crippled him. Crippled him in his hip. He never walked right again after that. And I, I thought about uh, 87 different things after thinking about that story. One, of course, is that he walked away a different man, but a better man, in spite of the limp. But the thing that really stuck with me is sometimes prayer requires effort. Prayer requires effort. And I think sometimes we toss out semi-casual prayers. You've heard me say this before. Sometimes we throw prayers at God and then we run away. Right? And that, that, I, that obviously is not it. Sometimes prayer requires effort. And I wonder, have you ever labored in prayer? Have you ever worked hard in prayer? Some of the things we need from God need more than just a throwaway prayer. God is so gracious and he's so good, isn't he? When we just toss up those casual prayers, he's like, okay, I understand. Don't worry about it. I get it. It's not that God's up there in heaven going, forget it. I'm not going to answer that one. You can't be any more respectful than that. That's not your heavenly father. Sometimes your heavenly father is like, yep, I got that one. Don't worry. Caught it. Got it. That's way over there, but I got it. Don't worry. But have you ever labored in prayer, worked hard in prayer, broke a sweat in prayer? You have to get on your knees sometimes, and you do have to cry out from the heart to God. And sometimes you will need to wrestle with God in prayer. And it may cost you. I don't know what or how. David Guzik comments here on this section. He says, much of our prayer is not effective simply because it's not fervent. It is offered with a lukewarm attitude that virtually asks God to care about something that we care little about. Effective prayer must be fervent, not because we must emotionally persuade a reluctant God, but because we must gain God's heart by being fervent for the things he is fervent for. You understand that? We need to be fervent for the things that he is fervent for. And there it is, I think. Are you and I fervent for the things that God is fervent for? And I think it's a huge issue because I think that we're not. I don't think that I am some, oftentimes, maybe more than I care to admit. And we wonder why our prayers don't get answered. That's because I'm not fervent for the things that God's fervent for. Are you even trying to find out what those things are? Or even looking to God and saying, I want to be fervent for the things that you're fervent are. Help me to be aligned with your purpose, Lord. What, how do you want me to pray for this person? How do you want me to pray for this situation? Lord, what should be the attitude that I have here? Have we ever asked that? Ever thought about that? Because our desires are not on the same page as God's desires. I was thinking about um, Psalm 37, verse 4. Psalm 37, verse 4. It's a verse that you guys know. Another refrigerator magnet. It says, delight yourself in the Lord and he shall give you the desires of your heart. We love that passage, don't we? He shall give you the desires of your heart. That's awesome. I got a lot of desires in my heart. I can't wait. God's going to cash my check. <laughs> but did you forget the first part of it? To delight yourself in the Lord. Oh, I'm going to be delighted when he gives me all the stuff that I desire. <laughs> no, no, that's not it, right? Have I forgotten what it means to delight myself in the Lord? Because when I'm delighted in the Lord, my attitude is more... Like the prayer of Jesus, nevertheless, not why my will, but yours be done. Now it's like, Lord, here's all the stuff that I want, but you know what? I'd rather have the stuff that you want. I've had all the stuff that I want. Look at all the stuff that I worked for. And it's rusting because I live at the beach. And I'm still making payments on it. And it's broken. And, you know, now, you know, a 50-inch TV is not nearly big enough, you know. But, you know, here it is anyways. And I paid all that money for it. Lord, how about this? Why don't you just give me what you want because I just love you and I think you're awesome. And you always do what is best. And your choices are always the best for me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. 
What does it take to get there, to that place? What does it take to get to that attitude? I don't, I'm not sure, but I think that effective, fervent, and earnest prayers from God's children is the way. I think that's the way to do it. I think we need to be more effective. I think we need to be more fervent. I think we need to be more earnest in our prayers. It was probably, not 100% positive, it was probably Martin Luther who said, prayer is not conquering God's reluctance, but taking hold of God's willingness. You don't have to talk God into doing what you want him to do. God's ready to rock and roll. Sometimes what we have to overcome is our own short-sightedness, <laughs> our own stubbornness, our own pride, our own desire to have what we want when we want it. And I wrote this in my notes just because I was thinking it. And that is, we have yet to see what God can and will do with you, for you, and through you. As you learn to pray like Elijah did, fervent, earnestly, righteously, willing to surrender to the Lord, but also putting in the necessary work as prayer is an ongoing app that runs in your life at all times. Not just something that you pause once or twice a day to do. Look, God can hear you anywhere, anytime, no matter what you're doing. Just keep launching those prayers up to Him. Keep talking to Him along the way because He's ready to hear from you. Let's pray. Lord, we, we know that you want to hear from us. You've even commanded us to pray and to pray without ceasing and for prayer to be an active part of our everyday life. So Lord, I pray this morning for myself and, and hopefully for all of us here too, that we might take prayer a little more seriously. That we might be a little bit more fervent a little more effectual, a little more diligent in these prayers. We might see prayer as something that runs and operates in our life at all times. Lord, help us not to fall into formality in prayer. Help us not to be inconsiderate in our prayers to you. And even in our prayers, Lord, just to settle down long enough to hear from you and let you clear the waters a little bit and to settle the dust that we might be aligned with your purpose. And even as we're praying now, salvation is only a prayer away. If you've never prayed to receive Christ as your Lord and your Savior, if you've never been born again by his Spirit, and I'm telling you that's why you're here this morning, so that you can. And it's only a prayer that's all it is, just between you and Him. It's not you joining a church. It's not any kind of formal thing. You're not joining a club or anything. This is strictly between you and God who made you. And it's just a prayer of surrender from yourself, from your heart. And He knows your heart. And He knows if you mean it or if you don't. If you want to pray to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you can pray right now. And it might be something as simple as this. I don't want to put words into your mouth, but it might be something as simple as this. Lord Jesus, I need you. Help me, please. I know that I've sinned. And I need your forgiveness. I believe as best as I am able that you died for me. And that you rose from the dead. Now come into my heart. I surrender my life to you. Fill me with your spirit that I might live for you all the days of my life. I commit my life to you now. Remember too that Jesus said in his word that all who come to me I would in no way cast out. He will not reject you. You just have to mean it from the heart. So now Jesus, as we go out, I pray that we would go out with prayer, being active, running in the background at all times, that we might pray like Elijah. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thanks for watching this week's service. If you'd like to know more about this or other topics, please visit our website at cchnb.org.
you'd like to see us in person sometime, we have Sunday service at 10 a.m., a Tuesday night Bible study at 7 p.m., a Wednesday night Bible study for young adults at 6.30 p.m., and a Thursday night service at 7 p.m.